recording in progress. All right, so uh, hello everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for another lecture in the Art on Tuesday series. And um, tonight it is with Jane O'Neill, O'Neill, right? Yes. Of Culturally Curious. Um, so uh, also my name is Sean Smith and I am the head of our services at the Chelmsford Library. Um, but um, Jane uh, holds a master's in art history from Boston University and a master's in education from the Harvard University Graduate School of Education. She is a New Hampshire native and has worked at some of the state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she served as executive director, and the Courier Museum of Art, where she held the role of senior educator. Jane founded uh, the Courier's Alzheimer's Cafe and led the tour program for the museum and the Frank Lloyd Wright Design Zimmerman House. Dave, don't answer. She has taught art history at the college level for more than a decade, most recently at the New Hampshire Institute of Art. Culturally, culturally, culturally curious is right off the tongue. <laughs> is to engage, educate, and unify groups through facilitated art experiences that inspire joy and foster critical and creative thinking, as well as appreciation for our shared humanity. And tonight, she will be presenting her program called Off With Their Heads, The Art of the French Revolution. Very catchy title. Um, from the over-the-top lavish lives of the royals at Versailles to portraits of revolutionary leaders to triumphant images of Napoleon, this program will examine art artwork from this period of tremendous political upheav upheaval with works by French masters, including, oof, Elizabeth. <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> Vijay Lebrun, Jacques-Louis David, and Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingres. Good enough. <laughs> <laughs> we'll consider the role of paintings in the struggle for power in the late 1700s and the early 1800s. Before I embarrass myself any further, I am going to let uh, Jane take the reins here. All right, thank you so much, Sean, for filling in for Jess and for the introduction and for having me back. I, it's always such a pleasure to connect with the Chelmsford Public Library and um, and all of your patrons because this is such a fabulous community and I, I really appreciate this opportunity. So as Sean mentioned tonight, we're looking at images from the French Revolution. I'm really delighted that you're interested in the subject. And I have to say, there are some really interesting parallels with, um, with what's happening in America today. There's a, we'll be looking at political violence and, um, and dis extreme disparities in wealth. <laughs> so it's interesting to th think about how these things played out and of course, how they played out visually. And, um, and what was the end result and, and sort of thinking about how this might relate to our world today. Uh, just a funny note in terms of my process, in terms of putting these programs together, I usually put the text in at the end. So a title slide like this would be one of the last things I do. And I always see this, um, like this serial killer font. And I always think there's no chance I'll ever have the opportunity to use something like this in one of my talks, but it seems pretty appropriate with, um, with the French Revolution and a title like this. So before we move on from this incredible image, I feel like I, I, I'm going to say just a few words about it. This is by a, an artist who we're not going to spend too much time with, unfortunately, but we will be looking at plenty of images of Marie Antoinette who is featured here. The artist's name is Gautier de Gauthier, and, um, and what an outfit, right? <laughs> this is, it's such a, an over the top, uh, dress and robe with the fleur de lis here and it's ermine lined and as I'm looking at it even more carefully tonight I notice that there's flowers at every bow along this dress and here she is reaching out um, resting her hand on the globe to suggest her not just her worldliness but um, but you know a, a sense of global domination here so we think of the French Revolution as um, as being a, sort of a, a sister uh, event to the American Revolution, but of course it was uh, it, it was a very complicated, very bloody, very violent event that uh, 
really uh, spanned over a, about a decade from 1789 to 1799. And so it is considered one of the most important events in Western history. And it is considered one of the foundational events for um, liberal democracy. So really important heady, heady things here tonight. And of course, a lot of great dresses. <laughs> So we'll dive in and we'll start with the lay of the land, our program overview. Let me give you a sense in terms of how we'll move through the material tonight. I broke it into three main parts, monar monarchy, revolution, and empire. For the monarchy, the little bit of um, sort of backstory, the, the preparation that we'll have for understanding the monarchy in, in terms of the visuals is getting familiar with Versailles, the palace of Versailles, the gardens of Versailles. So if you've never been there, um, it, I mean, this is like an opportunity to check this off your bucket list tonight because you, you might even feel like you've walked through Versailles uh, at a certain point, or at least the gardens. We'll talk a little bit about the uh, Rococo art in general, but we'll really Really zero in on the artist Vigie Lebrun. We'll turn our attention to the revolution and the, the um, most preeminent artist in France during the revolution, who is Jacques-Louis Jacques David. And then as, um, as the revolution winds down, we'll look at um, sort of who fills the void. And that is, of course, Napoleon. And he has his own um, ambitions when it comes to propaganda. So we'll look at uh, David and also Ang in, in that section. All right, so we've got a lot to cover. Let's head over to look at the monarchy. And like I said, the kind of uh, background that I'll be giving tonight is really focusing on Versailles. And I'm going to give you a little bit of history of Versailles that expands um, much further back than the French Revolution itself. But I think uh, you have to kind of understand what went into making a palace like Versailles um, in order to understand the French public's reaction against it uh, right around 1789. So um, if you've never been to Paris, let me get you uh, oriented here. We're looking at this incredible, beautiful antique map here. And it, it sort of looks like a botanical drawing or a, an anatomical drawing really. And right at the center, our beating red heart is Paris. And Versailles is a suburb that is just a little bit over 10 miles away. So it's walkable, but that's, that's a big feat. And there were uh, several different marches on Versailles from Paris. So you can imagine people were pretty determined to get there. You can see in the map here that, um, that really this kind of structured uh, space, that, that is the palace itself. And it's a pretty significant uh, uh, footprint. And of course, it's still a, a suburb today. It's it's just under 100,000 people, and it's um, it's still a pretty ritzy pr place to live. All right. So in the early 1600s, so this is way before the French Revolution, the Palace of Versailles gets started as a two-story hunting lodge for the king at the time, and and he he sort of. Uh, fancies it as as this uh, new seat of government. So he he quickly begins to expand upon it. And so we go from this two story hunting lodge to something that um, has these incredible expansive arms. And I love this image. Let me just double check the date here. Uh, this is from 1652, and you can actually see the king at the time. His his um, his horse and carriage just arriving at this new palace and, um, and being received by, by long lines of individuals over here. And as, as the palace was expanding, it was really important for the aristocracy and the nobility to be close by. You wanted to be as um, close to the seat of power as possible. So over here on the left, you had apartments for the nobility and the aristocracy. And over the years, Versailles continues to expand. Um, here, we're looking at an image that dates roughly to 1683, so about 100 years before the French Revolution. But we can see that the palace is just absolutely enormous at this point. The frame of this picture can't even contain all of the palace. So at this point, the nobility and the aristocracy, they don't have apartments nearby. They are in the building. And part of this is like, you want access, and everybody sort of wants to be seen 
and, um, and, and see other people. So inside this incredible structure here, there were various chapels that were built, destroyed and, and new ones built. And there was also an opera house that at the time that it was built, it was the largest opera house in Europe. It seated 700 people. So this was um, not just large, but very opulent. And, um, and we can see from all of the tiny figures in this particular image that it was bustling. There's all these people here. And and um, so here's our last kind of bird's eye view of the palace itself. And, and it's a photograph, so we know that this is fairly recent. And, and with the scale of, of the people down here, you get a sense of, of just how far away we are. And again, the palace itself isn't even contained within um, the frame of the, of the picture here. So when this, when this palace was fully operational, there were about 5,000 people living here. So it's the size of a small town. And, and those people had other people who were coming and going. So on a given day, there might be 10,000 people in the palace itself. Now, this was, of course, home to um, the king and the queen and their family uh, and, um, and the nobility and the aristocracy. But and all of their servants. And so depending on where you were in the palace itself, you might actually have some pretty cramped quarters and in some cases, even unhygienic quarters. But, um, but the main parts of the palace were just um, beautifully outfitted. There's so much marble here that it was nearly impossible to keep warm during, during the winter months. Uh, that being said, I believe there's about 1,200 fireplaces at Versailles. There's 67 staircases and 700 rooms. So it's enormous and it just goes on and on and on. And how do you fill those rooms with about 6,000 paintings and about 5,000 pieces of furniture? So, um, so like I said, this was a, 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 it's like a city in many ways and, and running it was incredibly expensive. Uh, I re I've read estimates from anywhere from um, about 5% to 25% of the entire annual budget of the country of France went towards maintaining and upkeeping this um, this incredible palace here. Now, how much did it cost to build something like this? Now, if you adjust for inflation and all of that, most estimates place it around um, somewhere between 200 and 300 billion with a B dollars. That really makes it one of the most expensive buildings ever made, really, it's unbelievable. Now, believe it or not, it's, um, it's not the largest palace in the world. It actually ranks 20th, but, if we take into account the garden, so we've sort of swung around here. This is the front of the building over here that we've been looking at. These are the expansive gardens out back. If you take into account the gardens, um, the Palace of Versailles is considered the world's largest royal domain, and it encapsulates more than 2,000 acres of land. So you can see here, these gardens are just, um, well, they continue on uh, for, uh, for an incredible amount of space, uh, almost a, a, a mind blowing amount of space if you're standing up here at the garden itself. This canal down here is a mile long and about 200 feet wide. And when you're standing up here, it really, you know, just looks short. It's so short, in fact, that I remember visiting it as a college student. My friend and I thought, well, let's just walk around the canal. And about four miles later, <laughs> we were absolutely exhausted. So this is all, um, well, close to the palace, this is all done in a French garden design. So it's very highly manu manicured. It's very tightly controlled. Um, the, the, um, the plants, everything growing there, it, it, it looks as though it's, it's kept up with, um, with, with like a fine tooth comb. And then as you move a little bit further away, it sort of gives it itself over to, to wooded areas. And then you have this whole other subdivision uh, over here on the left side of the image. And we'll be talking about that area in, in just a, a, a little while. So, uh, so just imagine creating gardens like this. And most of this was done under um, one king whose name was Louis XIV. He's known as the Sun King. So it took about 40 to 50 years to create gardens like this. And imagine doing this without 
you know, a bulldozer or an excavator. This was a major earthworks pro project and it was all essentially done by hand. And in addition to the Grand Canal, you have about 50 different fountains here as well. The fountains are really impressive and a, a, just a ton of sculpture. So uh, a, a really unbelievable, outstanding building that cost a fortune. Now let's turn our attention over to the art. I just mentioned Louis XIV, the Sun King. Here he is. This is our first impression of the French monarchy here. And it's with Louis XIV painted by an artist named Hyacinth Rigaud right around the year 1700. So we're still about um, 80 to 90 years before the French Revolution. But Louis XIV kind of sets the stage. <laughs> so he's known as the Sun King because he, um, he loved to dance. Look at those legs. He's really showing them off. Uh, and he was um, very influential in the establishment of ballet. So he danced in a ballet where he played Apollo, the sun god, and, and he received uh, so much uh, adulation for his performance that he was then known as the Sun King because of that. So here he is standing in red high heels in kind of a perfect fifth position, showing off those legs and showing off every other aspect of his wealth and power in a picture like this. And this is a 10 foot high uh, portrait. So it's, it's meant to really sort of uh, broadcast, showcase all of that authority that he has with the scepter and the crown and this incredible fleur-de-lis robe that's uh, lined with, with ermine fur here and this giant wig, of course. And he looks out at us with, you know, a fair amount of disdain. So Louis XIV was, uh, was king at a time when the popular style in art was known as Rococo. And the best example of Rococo art is over here on the right. And this is done by a French artist named Fragonard uh, around 1767. So this is his painting called The Swing. And, um, and it's a great example of Rococo because Rococo art generally is about the love lives of the nobility, of the aristocracy, of the people that um, were surrounding the king himself. So it never focused on the hardships of the working class in France. It was about sort of, you know, romantic dalliances and the frivolity of the that the wealth in their lives afforded. So in this case, we see a little bit of a romantic dalliance that's happening here. We have this beautiful woman in this incredible peach dress and the skirts are sort of flying up in the air as she is being pushed and pulled on the swing by this older man back here. Sometimes um, art historians refer to him as a bishop and in the recent research that I've done, sometimes he's referred to as like uh, uh, a man who's courting her, but she already has a boyfriend or she has another boyfriend who she has arranged to um, hide in this little garden area down here. And as she's flying up on the swing, she parts her legs, gives him a view, and, and it's just this kind of wild time in this untamed garden. She's even kicked off her little high heeled shoe and it looks as though it might hit this uh, sculpture of a Cupid that sort of seems to be telling her to hush, kind of admonishing her. But this is all about beauty. It's all about love. It's a little bit risque. This is the Rococo in a nutshell. And you could sort of imagine something like this happening in all parts of the, the gardens at Versailles on any given day. <laughs> so we flash forward a few generations and we meet King Louis the 16th. Now he is like the great, 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 great grandson of King Louis the 14th. And he is the, the monarch in charge of all of France at the time of the French Revolution. And even though there's um, several generations uh, in terms of distance between these two men, you can see that not a lot has changed in terms of the way that the monarchy is thinking of themselves and presenting themselves. It's essentially the same outfit, the same pose, although I think he was maybe a little bit more plump than Louis XIV, so he's not really showing off his legs in the same way. Poor Louis XVI, he did not feel really inclined to doing government work. And he recognized that there were a lot of big problems in France. He didn't think he was the right person to solve them. So he was kind of in um, an uncomfortable position in terms of his work. Now let's turn our attention to uh, one of the most preeminent artists at the time, whose name 
was Elizabeth Vigie Lebrun. And this is her self-portrait. She's about 27 years old when she painted this and she was born in 1755. So this is just a breathtaking portrait and, um, and an unbelievable life in so many ways. Because when we think about female artists, there are so few of them and so few of them that reached um, any real success in their lives. And essentially, Vigi Lebrun became like the unofficial official portrait painter to Marie Antoinette, to the Queen of France. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about her. She is she was largely self-taught. She essentially became a, a professional artist at the age of fourteen. When she was twenty years old, she even talked about I, uh, not needing a husband because she was already professional uh, professionally successful. In the end, she did marry um, somebody who was also an artist and an art dealer. So, um, so he helped to kind of, uh, well, he aided her in terms of her artistic education and traveled with her and showed her works from um, other countries and other museums. But in the end, she was really sort of closest to her daughter and we'll see a couple of portraits of her then. Now, Vigie Lebrun, her, um, her, her early education was, um, was actually in, in a nunnery. And one of the things that they focused on with her early education was the art of conversation, because that was considered something really important and essential if a woman was going to win a husband. And we'll see shortly how that comes into play in her life. It actually really helps her artistic career. But when you look at a portrait like this, she's so self-possessed. Um, presenting to us, to her, herself, to us, um, almost frontally here, but unabashedly uh, showing her her um, her her career, her her job as an artist with the palette and the wet brushes that still have color on them, and she's just gorgeous, so gro gorgeous, in fact, that um, that she's able to secure commissions with the aristocracy, with the nobility in France, and they actually want to borrow her look and borrow her actual clothes. There's that same black shawl over here. So she was a real influencer in her time. And, and that's really how, um, how she came to work for Marie Antoinette, because you have all of these wealthy women who are getting beautiful portraits painted by this young, um, really uh, up and coming artist. Now, one of my favorite stories about Vigie Lebrun is that she was so beautiful and so talented that a lot of the men who sat for portraits with her would kind of become enamored with her during the process. So she came up with this sort of ingenious way to, kind, to keep them from fixating on her as she worked. She would ask them to look kind of up and off to the side so that they, they weren't just staring at her. And if they got too involved with talking to her or looking at her, she would sort of say, I'm painting your eyes now. Can you look over there? So um, it's something to look out for when you're, when you're looking at portraits of men by Vigie Lebrun. So all of these connections to very wealthy, influential people connected Vigie Lebrun ultimately to the Queen of France, Marie Antoinette. And here we see her again in another knockout dress. This is Vigie Lebrun's painting of the Queen that dates to 1778. So we're still a little bit ahead of the, the French Revolution itself. But I mean, what a statement in terms of her wardrobe, um, her accessories, the setting here. Marie Antoinette looks um, incredibly wealthy, incredibly aloof. And there's all these references to her power. There's a beautiful crown over here and even a sculptural bust of her husband. I saw some joke online um, some time ago, but I think of it every time I look at this picture. And that is something to the effect of, you know, this is the perfect dress to smuggle a widescreen TV out of a party, <laughs> which I think of every time I see it. So um, it's covered with bows and tassels and frills. And you can only imagine, um, you know, how complicated it was to make and let alone wear. So Marie Antoinette had written to friends and family that she was really uh, displeased with the kinds of portraits that artists had been producing of her right up until she met Vigie Lebrun. So she was sort of primed to meet somebody who made her look, made her look great. And, and here, I mean, she is the height of fashion and she even has the high hair to go along with it. Now in this early portrait, Vigie Lebrun does something interesting. She captures, um, 
sort of the queen's imperfections, but she kind of softens them. Marie Antoinette was part of the Habsburg family line, which was notoriously inbred in Europe. They were known for having a, a sort of a lantern jaw, a prominent jaw. So you see that a little bit here. And Marie Antoinette was also known to have kind of bulging eyes, which you also see here. And over time, the two, the artist and her patron here would collaborate at least for 30 more portraits. So over time, um, Vigie Lebrun softens these features even more so. It's kind of um, an 18th century version of Photoshop or, um, or going under the knife even. So she, she creates something that, um, that her patron, the Queen of France, is quite pleased with. Now, not everybody else was pleased with what Vigie Lebrun was doing, but isn't this an interesting um, comparison here? Because this is a 1783 portrait of the queen. And it looks like in so many ways, she's really trying to emulate the woman who's painting her. She's wearing a very simple dress, a hat with a feather, a straw hat at that. And that's just what we see with our artist. Um, these white dresses sort of became all the rage in, in these years, but they were considered completely inappropriate for a monarch to be wearing. People expected um, their monarchs to be wearing something really elaborate. Like you wouldn't, uh, women wouldn't necessarily wear something like this out of the house. So she looks um, way too simple, way too much like a peasant to be presented as a monarch like this. And it really ruffled a lot of feathers in France, but it fits in so well with what Marie Antoinette was doing at Versailles at the time. So we're going to go back to a map of Versailles here. Here's the front of the palace itself. Here are all those manicured gardens, the Grand Canal. And, um, and then there's that sort of space off to the side. And you can see there's a pond here and it's labeled Le Rameau, which is the hamlet. And that's what we're seeing over here on the right. Marie Antoinette had this rustic Norman village built in sort of, you know, this great distance from the palace itself. Uh, ostensibly, she was educating her children here, but she was kind of playing peasant. Uh, she had her own bedroom here. <laughs> she would uh, uh, have guests here as well. And so she was kind of pretending to be a poor person, which you can imagine didn't go over well with the poor people of France. Um, I'm not sure how many of them know, knew about this particular um, extravagance of the Queens, but it, it would certainly not be something that would be very popular with the public in general. Um, so within a year, Vigie Le Lebrun had repainted or created a new portrait of the Queen where she was more appropriately attired, wearing just this stunning dress. I love sort of the sheen on the fabric here and all these little wrinkles and folds, the, the lace that's been captured. It's just so stunning in so many ways. Um, so Vichy Lebrun begins to play a really important role in shaping the queen's image in terms of PR, because as, um, as these disparities in wealth sort of grew and were exacerbated, uh, the queen became a major scapegoat. She, she was a foreigner. She started off on the right foot in France, but, but she became the person um, that was the focus of a lot of public ire. So, um, so, so Vigie Lebrun was sort of like a PR agent in many ways. And a few years later, she creates this image of the queen from 1787, where we see a more stately portrayal of the queen. She's not wearing a simple house dress here. It's, it's something more appropriate to a monarch, but it's not one of those giant dresses where she could smuggle out a flat screen TV. She's sort of walking a tightrope here. And really importantly, she's being shown with her children. Look at how this dog Daughter is just gazing up at her mother with all this affection. She's holding a baby on her lap. And there's even an empty bassinet here. The black drapery on it indicates that Marie Antoinette has lost a child. So that's really something to that, um, you know, to it garner sympathy. Uh, and it was it was in fact true, but it would certainly garner sympathy from the public that would that would view something like this. 
So, um, so this had a, a major impact in terms of the way people were thinking of her. And it's a long way away from some of those earlier portrayals of the queen um, before she connected with, with Vigie Lebrun. Here she is a much more sympathetic character, not just a mother, but the mother of France, really. Um, and that I, I love this, this uh, gaze of adoration here. And, and it's the same kind of pose that Vigie Lebrun herself would paint when she painted later self-portraits with her own daughter. So she really knew how to capture something that spoke to like real human emotion. And she inserted that in, in, the, queen's, in, in the queen's portraits here. Now, um, despite her best efforts, <laughs> Marie Antoinette was still really the focus of a lot of public scrutiny and, um, and remained sort of the scapegoat in terms of um, uh, the spending of, of, the mar of the monarchy. So there was a women's march on, um, on Versailles. Uh, women who worked in the markets of Paris actually marched all the way 10 miles plus from the city to the palace gained access to the palace, um, tried to have a sort of a tet, a tet with the legislative body there, but then within 24 hours, they actually stormed the queen's apartment and she escaped with her life. She got out about a minute before they got there. So that was really kind of one of the major events that, that started the French Revolution, not one that you hear about that often, but they were, they were inside the palace and they were looking for her. So Vigie Lebrun, um, feeling that things are getting sort of, sort of heating up in France, goes into voluntary exile, which is a very nice way of saying she escaped for her life. <laughs> um, so she traveled around Europe with her daughter and worked in major cities and even in Russia. Uh, painted more kings and queens and princes and princesses and, and members of no, the um, nobility and had an outstanding career after leaving France. In fact, um, the Medici family in Florence asked for her to paint a self-portrait as part of their museum's collection, the Uffizi's collection of self-portraits of, of significant artists. So this is the self-portrait that she created for them. Um, it dates to 1790. So so right around the time that the French Revolution is underway. And you can see that she's painting someone here that looks an awful lot alike, an awful lot like Marie Antoinette. So she's sort of saying, you know, this is, this is what got my career going. So we have a sense that things are heating up. So let's turn our attention to the revolution. Every time I've thought about revolution over the past week or so, the Beatles have popped into my head. <laughs> so, um, so we're just going to dive in, but uh, I, I provided a little bit of background with Versailles, understanding the monarchy. I want to provide a little bit of background in terms of enlightenment thought and understanding um, how and why the revolution kind of came into being. And one of the things that happened with, um, with philosophers, enlightenment philosophers, is that they began to think about this notion of the divine right of kings. This was really the first time it began to be questioned. Uh, I mean, prior to this, people just thought, well, you know, the king's been selected by God, so of course he's going to rule us. But you have people like um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who says, you know, power comes from the people. It doesn't come from God. So, um, so we decide who's in charge and we decide who has power. And, um, and this was a whole major shift in the way people thought about government. So this is really tied into enlightenment thinking, which is also tied into um, scientific thinking, empirical thinking, um, basing decisions on, on um, visual evidence and, and looking at, at facts as opposed to, you know, going along with, um, with, with things that were maybe uh, more grounded in, in religion or, or tradition. So that being said, I think another great way of understanding the French Revolution is with this cartoon over here. And this shows us kind of the three sections of French society. One of them is the monarchy slash nobility. One of them is the clergy. And one of them is essentially everyone else. That's 98% of the French public. And in this cartoon, you can see that the French public, the poor people, 
are holding up the monarchy and the clergy here. And the text says something like, you should hope that this game will be over soon. So you can see that there's um, there's this fermenting thought around this, around, around power and the monarchy, that, that people were kind of ready to be done with it. And that brings us to um, the major flashpoint of the French Revolution, which is the storming of the Bastille. We, this is not a, a significant painting that we're looking at here. Um, the artist's name is um, Jean-Pierre Huel. It's, it's not something that I, any, anybody would ever say is, is a masterwork, but I think it gives us a good kind of visual in, in terms of imagining what the storming of the Bastille might have looked like, although the Bastille, which was uh, essentially like a medieval prison fortress, it didn't really loom over the city. It was, um, uh, in terms of the lay of the land, it was kind of equal in height to everything else around it. So it was um, it was an armory, it was a prison, and it, it sort of represented the monarchy in many ways because they were uh, stockpiling weapons and munitions there. So one day about a thousand revolutionaries gather outside of the Bastille, essentially rallying to open it up, release the prisoners inside who were sort of viewed as political prisoners because of the fact that, you know, this is, it's become a political event and, um, and sort of distribute some of these weapons. There's about a hundred people inside the Bastille at this point, and there's a battle kind of back and forth. The people outside lose about uh, a 10%, a hundred people out of a thousand, and there are a few deaths inside. Ultimately, they gain access to this fortress and they release the, the prisoners, all seven of them. <laughs> but it becomes symbolic of, um, of essentially throwing, overthrowing the tyranny of the monarchy. Now, just to give you, get you situated in terms of place and time, Thomas Jefferson was in Paris and kind of watched the whole thing unfold. He wrote a whole letter home describing what he saw as, um, as the people of France um, rose up and, and, um, and stormed the Bastille. And it was very much considered a good thing. So in the months that followed the, the storming of the Bastille, this uh, medieval building was taken apart brick by brick. They sort of became souvenirs in their own right. And the, the key to the Bastille, this very heavy key, it weighs more than a pound, was given as a symbol to George Washington. And here it is um, on display at Mount Vernon down in Virginia. George Washington would like take it around to parties and show people, uh, kind of saying like the French are doing what we did. Isn't this fantastic? But the storming of the Bastille, like the French Revolution itself, was um, was a little bit more bloody than than um, than history really likes to acknowledge. So, for instance, <laughs> the man who was the governor of the Bastille, who who oversaw the whole thing, he was dragged out of the building, brought to the Hotel de Ville, and um, and beaten up. He essentially begged for his own death. They kill him. They um, they behead him, and they put his head on a pike. And these are revolutionaries, sort of dancing with his head on a pike, following the storming of the Bastille. So this was a traditional way for the monarchy to kind of uh, show power and to scare people. And and we see revolutionaries doing the same thing. So before too long, you have um, the physician. Um, Joseph Ignace Guillot, who's part of the revolutionaries, who suggests, you know, if we're going to execute people, we should do it in a more humane, a more egalitarian way. His idea for the guillotine is, um, is based in enlightenment thought. It's this idea that everybody should die the same quick, um, humane death. Because at this time, you know, criminals were hung, hanged, and um, and they could, you know, that could take minutes, and the nobility were beheaded, and uh, and if you could sort of bribe the executioner, you might have a really sharp blade, and it might be painless and quick. So here he is thinking everybody should be able to have the same kind of death. And he, um, he doesn't invent the guillotine, it already sort of existed, but he helps to perfect it. And it is very much a result of the revolutionaries thinking. So what we're looking at over here on the right is actually a pair of guillotine earrings. 
guillotines become so much a part of French culture during this time that there's not just earrings that people are wearing. People give them little um, toy versions of guillotines to children so that they can guillotine their dolls. Um, there are tabletop guillotines because you might want to chop your veggies at your dining room table this way. And with this, with these particular earrings here that date to around 1790, we can see they're topped with what's known as a Phrygian cap. Um, usually it's depicted in red and it's a symbol of the revolutionaries. We have um, the guillotine structure itself with the blade and the stockade down here. And then if you're looking carefully, you've probably noticed the head of the king that has um, fallen off. <laughs> so um, so we've got the sense that, that the violence that goes around uh, uh, executions is um, is very much normalized and it becomes a part of French society. And of course, the guillotine uh, is, is the cause of death for Louis XVI, who we met at Versailles. Um, here, he, here he is in um, a contemporary image of his death. This is in, if you're familiar with France, this is now known, this is great rebranding, as Place de la Concorde. But back then, it was Place de la Revolution. And so, um, so you have all these people who have come out to see the death of the king, the end of the monarchy. And they actually hold up his head over here so that everybody can see. And there was a sculpture of his grandfather up here that had been torn down. So a really sort of... Um, uh, important event and symbolic in so many ways. So this was the fate of the king and also Marie Antoinette, who we spent some time getting to know. This is her head being raised up by the executioner following her um, execution by way of guillotine at, in, in the same spot as her husband about um, nine months later. So, uh, so it wasn't just the king and the queen that were beheaded, just to give you a sense in terms of how radical and how violent the French Revolution was over the space of about a year, approximately just shy of 17,000 people were executed by way of guillotine um, it, as part of the French Revolution. So, um, so things sort of escalate quickly and there's a lot of infighting amongst the revolutionaries, a lot of conspiracy thinking, um, a lot of talk of, you know, this, this faction is going to revolt against us. So, you know, off with their heads essentially. So this is um, a, an extremely bloody time in world history. Um, and so it's once, once you kind of delve into it, you see how very different this is from the American Revolution, almost in some ways more closely connected with the Salem witch trials. So in terms of art, we are coming, you know, a, a great ways away from the Rococo that we saw in, um, in the early 1700s, mid 1700s. And we're moving into enlightenment thinking and the neoclassical style. We're actually looking at a portrait of the enlightenment philosopher Diderot here, who is also an art critic. And he wrote about um, the fact that art should have a moral quality to it. It should make virtue attractive and vice odious. He's really writing about um, the main goals of art. He's helping to shape um, the visuals around, um, around a revolution in some ways. And significantly here, he is not wearing a wig, which was really normal for anybody of, of social standing at the time. It was a very, um, it was an expected way to frame the face in the same way that, that we think pictures should have frames. It was expected that a face should have this, um, expected kind of formula, formulaic frame to it. But by not wearing a wig, he's sort of showing that he's a free thinker in many ways. So let me introduce you to the most important artist from this era. And he is the most important artist in all of France. And his name is Jacques-Louis David. Now he's older than Vigi Le Brun by, um, by just a few years, but his career, could not be more different from hers. Now, she was attractive and she was social. He was, um, <laughs> well, it's a little bit hard to see in this self-portrait, 
but he was severely scarred from a sword fight. And you can see that there's like a line running on his cheek. And as a result of that scar, he actually grew a benign tumor that made it very hard for him to speak. So in addition to being disfigured, he couldn't really carry out a conversation in a way that didn't kind of um, negatively draw attention to himself. Now, on top of that, you have Vigi Lebrun who could sort of strategize and, um, and, and kind of knew how to create a career for herself against the odds. And then you have somebody like Jacques-Louis David who, um, who almost seemed desperate and emotional by comparison. So when he was a student studying, uh, studying art, he very desperately wanted to win this award called the Prix de Rome. Um, which, which was the highest honor for a, an art student at the time. And the first year he went for it, he didn't get it. The second year he went for it, he didn't get it again. He was so emotional about losing that he actually um, did a hunger strike which is such a sore loser <laughs> approach to losing anything. Um, it doesn't really solve anything, but the third year that he went for it, he did win um, the Prix de Rome, which allowed him to go to Rome to study the art of classical anti antiquity. And we'll see how that kind of um, influences his artwork. But I wanted to show you uh, an example of portraiture by Jacques-Louis David. That's not really what he's best known for, but it's a great portrait and it's in an American collection so we can see it in person. So this is his portrait of Madame and Monsieur Lavoisier, and this dates to um, 1788, so just before the revolution. It's in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and it's about eight and a half feet tall. It's just, it's gorgeous. It's really striking. You can't just walk by it. And we see that same kind of white dress that Marie Antoinette kind of helped to popularize it, um, just a few years before. So what we're looking at here is not some sort of frivolous dalliance uh, that we, you would see in the Rococo. Instead, we have husband and wife here. And the husband's looking at his wife as an equal because they together would do scientific experiments. And so we see them as very thoughtful people collaborating in this particular picture. In fact, Monsieur Lavoisier conducted experiments with gunpowder and he actually got special permission and access to the Bastille in order to access gunpowder. That access caused um, a great deal of suspicion after the revolution began, and he ultimately met the fate of, um, of being guillotined himself uh, once the revolution was underway. So, so this is an example of David's portrait painting, but what he's best known for um, are his history paintings. And his history paintings, especially those that he created just leading up to the revolution, are, um, are influenced by that time that he spent in France. They are incredible examples of neoclassical painting in general, but they were also kind of carefully designed to help whip people up. <laughs> and I'll tell you how they did that. So what we're looking at here is a painting called the, the Oath of the Horatii. Sometimes you hear it pronounced as the Oath of the Harati. And this version is from 1784. So about five years before the revolution happens. And, um, and this is a painting that is about the classical past. It's a story of um, of, of a city, uh, of the city of Rome and another city called Alba. And these were warring city-states and instead of sending all of their strong young men into battle, they decide to do a different kind of war, a really smart kind of war, if you ask me. They just decide to send three guys from each side. Those three guys will fight, whoever's left standing wins the war. So in this case, these three brothers the, Her the Her Her Herati brothers are pledging to their father that they will be the ones that go and fight on behalf of their city state. So their arms are out, everything about them is sort of um, angular, erect, um, linear, strong. Um, whenever I look at this picture, my eyes for some reason always go right down to the father's calves here and you can see the veins in his legs, you can see the muscles in all of their legs. There's this incredible kind of raking light across the whole image that um, spells everything out with this incredible clarity. So what they are doing is about 
patriotism. It's about sacrifice. It's about loyalty. So those themes were, were intentional. Those themes were, were, were um, selected to, to whip people up, to think about, you know, sacrificing yourself for, your, for the country that you love. Uh, I should also mention that um, Jacques-Louis David, at this point in his career, did not have the highest esteem for um, the civic value and participation of women. So you'll notice there are all these women over here, um, the relatives and wives of, of the men um, and the other two thirds of the picture. And they're so emotional, they can't even open their eyes. They're like hardly sentient beings. But, um, but the, you know, they're having an emotional reaction to, to, to what's happening here. Uh, David spells the whole story out in this very clear space that's inspired by um, the Roman past with these rounded Roman arches and the orthogonals um, uh, sort of organizing the space on the floor here. So it's, uh, it's great storytelling. It's really clean storytelling and it's neoclassical, new classical inspired by the classical past. Now, one other painting that's neoclassical in style that he painted right, right before the revolution began is this one here. It's known as the Lictors Bring to Brutus the bodies of his sons. So this is 1789. Um, sometimes these titles sound a little bit wonky because they're being translated from the French. So Brutus here was the founder of the Roman Republic. And, um, and, and so of course, that's what the French are sort of rallying for at this point. Now, what Brutus has done is that he has called for the death of his own sons. In this case, really the beheadings of his sons because his sons wanted to overthrow the Republic and restore the monarchy, essentially restore power to their father in a different way, absolute power to their father. And their own father called for their death. So here are the sons who have been beheaded, who are being brought in. The women, again, are having an emotional reaction to this. And Brutus is just kind of um, brooding <laughs> in the shadows here. But you see how his feet are kind of overlapping each other like this. And you get this sense that there's all this tension in, in his legs and in, in his toes as he's contemplating what he's done. So why would something like this whip people into a revolutionary fervor? Well, once again, we're talking about sacrifice. We're talking about patriotism. We're talking about, um, you know, sort of overthrowing um, anybody who has... Um, uh, thoughts around a, a monarchy, uh, condemning them to death, uh, essentially, in b to maintain the rights of the people. So that's right in line with enlightenment thinking and right in line with what the revolutionaries were rallying for. Um, in fact, the, the monarchy tried to prevent the exhibition of this work and Jacques-Louis David's students um, ultimately agreed to stand guard in front of it because it, it inspired uh, such zeal when people looked at it. So things take a turn for Jacques-Louis David um, as the revolution gets underway. And I should mention that as an artist, he was right in the thick of all of this. He was, um, he was a part of, of the revolution in, um, in, in ways that are hard to imagine. He was actually one of the people that voted for the execution of the King of France. He was somebody who was designing costumes for revolutionaries. He would design public events, um, funerals for, um, for revolutionaries that, that died in battle, you know, big, big public displays like this. So this is a key image in how his works change. We see a shift away from the, the classical past with an image like um, this one over here on the right that's called the Oath of the Tennis Court. And I'll tell you a little bit about this work in just a moment, but I think it's worth going back to this cartoon that we started with and understanding that there were like these three separate bodies in terms of French government. Everybody sort of had a say. Um, and, um, and then one day when they, meant, went, when they went to meet to create a constitution, the, um, the third estate, essentially the people, the poor people were shut out of the process. And so they reconvened inside a tennis court at Versailles, all 577 of them. And they essentially 
stood there and pledged to each other that they wouldn't disassemble until they created um, a, a constitution for the people. So this was the first time in terms of civic life that, um, that the people were overthrowing the monarchy. We'd seen the Bastille before, which was violent. And, and this was kind of a civic decision. And it's a passionate decision. And in every way, it is echoing those pictures that Jacques-Louis David created. It's about patriotism, loyalty, sacrifice, all of these things that he had been kind of um, telegraphing to the people of France prior to this. So again, there's hundreds of people in this. It was intended to be a huge painting with life-size figures. Uh, this is just a drawing for it. The, the painting itself was unfinished and there's a good reason for this. It took a long time to, to start it and the revolution was moving so quickly that some of the main characters here um, uh, their, the perception, the public perception of them was quickly shifting. So it didn't really make sense to continue on with it. But it's worth say, noting that what he's doing here is a huge shift in painting in general. Uh, to create a history painting on current events was a huge shift in the way um, history paintings were thought of and revolutionary in its own right. So uh, this tennis court is uh, still standing today. You can go and visit it. This is a photograph from 2014 where we can see a reproduction of the work from David and a little sculpture over here with a key figure in that, that uh, important pose of, of promising, you know, pledging yourself over there. So another important uh, work that Jacques-Louis David created was this one here, which is called The Death of Marat, one of the most significant works from the French Revolution. It dates to 1793. Now, this is such an interesting image because the image itself is really powerful. The person, um, being uh, described in this painting is a very complicated person. And it's somebody that, um, that obviously Jacques-Louis David is trying to um, sort of lionize, to pay homage to in, in this particular uh, image painting. So Marat here was a journalist. And if we think of some journalists uh, sort of on the fringes today, they can really whip people up into a frenzy. They can call for violence and, and, um, and get people to be violent. And that is uh, essentially the power of this particular journalist here. So he, um, he was sitting in a bath, which he spent most of his days doing because he had a horrible, painful skin, skin condition. And a young woman named um, Charlotte Corday gained access to his home and came and sat with him for about 15 minutes and they spoke together. And then you can see she stabbed him. She stabbed him in the chest. And, and he expired in this bathtub here. So um, in his hand, uh, Marat is holding uh, um, a document that, that Charlotte Corday used to gain access to see him. And, and Jacques-Louis David is sort of showing that he worked as a writer uh, and then also um, uh, gives his signature and a title to the, to the work down here. So uh, interestingly enough, uh, Charlotte Corday actually didn't uh, murder him and flee. She murdered him and stuck around so that when the authorities came, she said, yeah, I did this. I, I think he's guilty of, of essentially inciting violence. So I thought I'd kill one man and save 100,000 lives. So she, within the space of four days, she was also executed. So um so what Jacques-Louis David is doing with this incredible image is he is creating a new kind of painting. Uh, we, we were all familiar, the entire world was familiar with images of religious martyrs. Here we have um, Michelangelo's sculpture, the Pieta with the dead Christ in his mother's arms. What Jacques-Louis David has done here is he's created a political martyr. And, and we know that that can really, um, uh, cause strong feelings in the people who subscribe to certain political beliefs. And that is exactly uh, the effect that this particular picture had. Uh, here he, sort of like Michelangelo, he's made his subject uh, incredibly beautiful when in fact Marat 
was not necessarily that. This is another uh, portrayal of Marat from Jacques-Louis David here. Uh, here's a close up of that note from, um, from Corday and just a few other images by other artists who revisit the story and, and tell it from a slightly different perspective. Uh, this is Edward Monk over here, famous for the scream, who sort of interestingly decides to tell the story of Marat with two nude figures here. But um, David's painting has served as inspiration to so many works uh, in, in um, the visual arts and, and in cinema and in, in music on album covers. So this is just one example. This is a 2002 movie called About Schmidt. This is uh, Jack Nicholson sleeping in a bathtub, clearly quoting um, uh, Jacques-Louis David's painting. So we have this sense that uh, the artist here is very deeply entrenched in the politics that he is painting. And one of the most extraordinary aspects of his career from this time is that he was there when Marie Antoinette was um, heading to the guillotine. And he sketched this image of her just moments before her death. I have always found this to be just an, like a, a jaw-dropping, astounding sketch of a human being, particularly considering where she came from, what her life looked like. Now, she and the king tried valiantly to save their own lives. Um, they were essentially captured uh, by the French people. They tried to escape. They actually even tried to um, incite a war with, with Austria, I believe, um, to, uh, to start a war with France so that they could be saved. And so for this reason and many others, the French people decided uh, they, they deserve to be executed. They are traitors. So, um, so this is the final moments of her life where she has fallen from this, uh, this esteemed position to, to looking like uh, an average French woman here on, on the, uh, you know, on her way about town, but in this case, on her way to her death. It's just, um, it's just such a shocking transition from, from one uh, depiction of her to the next. So uh, Jacques-Louis David incredibly <laughs> avoids the, the guillotine himself. And he does this essentially by missing a meeting because of an upset stomach. Everybody else at the meeting um, was executed, <laughs> arrested and executed. He uh, was simply ar arrested later and went to prison. This is a portrait, a self-portrait that he created while he was in prison. And we'll see in our next session, next section that he continues to work under the new regime. So we'll finish up with empire. Um, we have uh, Napoleon Bonaparte who uh, rises up into power following the, the French Revolution. First, he serves as first consul and then as empire. And I think you'll see, or emperor, I should say. And I think you'll see from the visuals that um, there isn't much of a distinction from emperor to monarch. But these are some early depictions of Napoleon by Jacques-Louis David. And Napoleon uh, essentially outright asks David to be the first painter to the emperor. Um, so he's playing a, an, an important role in terms of political propaganda going into a new and entirely different kind of regime, which causes a lot of people to think, um, to, to question, you know, what were his actual political beliefs throughout all of this? Was he just um, there, for, there for the work or did he feel fervently about um, the politics that he was uh, portraying? So this image over here on the right is one of his most reproduced images and it's Napoleon crossing the Alps. Now, Napoleon was um, and still is uh, a highly regarded military strategist and he was known to, um, invade other countries. <laughs> and in this case, he is leading the French army across the Alps for one of these invasions. And he and Jacques-Louis David sort of confer on what they want this image to look like after the fact. Um, and they agree to essentially uh, make Napoleon look young and heroic, look powerful. He's rearing up on this white steed. Uh, the wind is is um, is ruffling his, his cloak and, and the mane and the tail of the horse. And he looks in every way like an authority figure, like a, a person of consequence here. Um, it, when in fact, he actually crossed the Alps days after his own army and on the back of a mule. So everything about this is really sort of carefully designed to convey a specific idea of who Napoleon was. 
Jacques-Louis David also got the incredible commission of painting Napoleon's coronation that we see here. And actually in this image, this is Napoleon who has already crowned himself and he is about to crown his wife, Josephine. These are his brothers and sisters and their wives and husbands. Um, up here is Napoleon's mother who didn't actually attend this event. And even above her is David in a self-portrait showing himself sketching as everything unfolds. He um, includes a few of his family members and all of this is happening at, um, at Notre Dame Cathedral, I should mention. And this was a really important um, grouping over here. These were essentially ambassadors from other companies countries and all of the pomp and circumstance that you see in unfolding in the cer ceremony was in large part for their benefit so that they could go back to their homes and, and talk about how impressive and powerful Napoleon was. This is a gigantic painting. It's about, it's over 30 feet long. All of these figures that are painted here are, um, are life size. So, um, so here we can sort of zoom in on Napoleon and, and see him kind of in the flesh. So, so we have David continuing on as in this really sort of preeminent role, continuing on as the, the most important artist in all of France. Now he has a whole workshop, um, uh, all of these students who are learning and working underneath him. And one of them is this artist whose name is Jean-Auguste Dominique Eng. And this is his self-portrait from the age of 24, it dates to 1804. So this is after the French Revolution. Now, one of the most incredible incredible thing about Aang's work is that he makes the brushwork disappear. He is the exact opposite of like a Claude Monet. Something it's, he has a way of making um, every texture that he's painting really look like that actual texture and not like it's paint being applied to a canvas. So, um, so you have this incredible cloak here, the linen shirt, the smooth skin, the silky hair. Um, there's just this kind of tactile, alluring quality to his work. Now, he was a student of David's. He was very young during the revolution. I don't know much about um, his political alliances, but he weathered it and he's on the other side. And, um, and Napoleon's looking at his um, artistic master and him as well. Uh, there's such demand for, uh, for images at this time. So Ang creates this image of Napoleon right around the same time of his self-portrait. Um, this is when Napoleon was just first consul and not emperor. But we see a, 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 a sort of a reputable a portrayal of, of Napoleon as a civic leader. Here he is pointing to laws over here on the table. He's wearing the, the red velvet waistcoat and, and, and pants, and he's got his hand tucked into his waistcoat, which is the classic Napoleon pose. I remember in um, as a college student, everybody was always theorizing that he had some sort of skin condition, that he was also always scratching, which was why his hand was in his coat. But that was just the way that... Um, that reputable men stood at the time. So, so he's, he's clearly able to create um, impressive images of Napoleon, but he also got the opportunity to create a portrait of Napoleon in his coronation robes. And this is an image that I had the, the, the joy of seeing in person at the Metropolitan Museum probably about two decades ago at this point. Um, it, it, the, the, Attention to surface detail is just unbelievable. <laughs> every, um, every detail from the carpet to the gold embroidery to Napoleon's face to the, to the lace around, uh, around framing his face. Uh, this is just such an unbelievable picture to take in. Um, Aang's ability to capture this detail is, is just, it's breathtaking and it's awe-inspiring. But this was uh, an image that was sort of universally reviled by the French public. Now, if we think back to Marie Antoinette, people liked the way this picture was painted. They just didn't like her. It's sort of the opposite with Aang and, and Napoleon over here. They sort of like Napoleon at this point, but the way this, this portrayed his power was um, really not pleasing to people. Was, people called it Gothic. He sort of looked like um, uh, some sort of Byzantine monarch and, and they didn't like to think of him in those terms. Now, fortunately for Aang, he goes on for decades to create, to have this very um, 
profitable and prestigious uh, line of business as a portrait painter. These are just some of the portraits that he created. Um, this is uh, from 1832, one of my favorite portraits by him of, um, of, uh, of a journalist. I just, I, I love the expression on his face and these sort of fat fingers that are perched on his knees over here. And this gorgeous depiction of, um, of a princess from uh, 1853. This is also at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. You can see it in person, but the way that dress is painted is just such a knockout. Again, his ability to capture that surface detail is just uh, uh, amazing to me. Now, Napoleon's fortunes really rise and fall, and it's fascinating to see how artists over the ages sort of captured it. Uh, his military career launched his political career, and it started in Egypt. So here's a great depiction of him on horseback looking at the Sphinx in Egypt, and his political career and his life ended in exile. <coughs> on the island of St. Helena um, off the coast of Africa. So here he is staring out at the sea kind of all by himself, though he was not alone on the island. Uh, decades after his death at the age of 51, French artists were still going back and kind of revisiting how he was thought of, how he was esteemed. This is an artist who in, 18, in 1848 goes back and, and sort of reevaluates Jacques-Louis David's painting from almost half a century earlier and decides to show Napoleon on the back of a mule, <laughs> looking a little bit more pathetic than, um, than this really uh, sort of propaganda image that, that D David had created for the emperor. All right, so we are going to tie things up very neatly by bringing them back to Versailles. When Napoleon came into power, he did go to Versailles. I mean, he had full authority to live there, run it, but he quickly realized that it would take a lot of money to bring this palace up to good living conditions. And he was way more interested in invading other countries than starting a big renovation project. So he and his family lived out in these out palaces, essentially called the Grand Trianon and the Petit Trianon. And they did a little bit of renovation there, but it was wasn't, um, it wasn't by any stretch of the imagination what they were focused on. Now, uh, we all know that his political fortunes end at Waterloo. Um, and over the next few decades, there's uh, uh, several kings that, that come back into power who are directly related to King Louis XVI. And, um, and several uprisings, one of them that brings down the monarchy. And then the very last monarch is, is put into place. His name is King Louis, the Philippe, Louis Philippe. He is installed as monarch in 1830. And he is the very last monarch in all of France. And just to kind of blow your mind here, he is also um, so far up in time that we also have a photograph of him. So Louis Philippe is over here in, in this photograph. I think it's just interesting that here, you know, we've got a painting from about 1790 to 1830, and we see that um, that how we visualize the royals has really changed too. That Louis Philippe looks a little bit more like Napoleon in terms of dress and 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 how he's showing himself to the public, um, rather than like Louis <laughs> uh, Louis the Sixteenth here. So Louis Philippe is um, really interested in. Uh, giving Versailles sort of back to the people. And he, he here's a, a, a painting of him right here at the center, dedicating a major gallery space in Versailles that has gigantic paintings depicting uh, victorious battles throughout French history. And he is the person that decides that Versailles will become a museum and not the seat of French power and not the home of a monarch. So, to, in order to wrap up today, <laughs> the legacy in terms of visuals of the French Revolution. Um, you can't really talk about revolution without sort of touching upon this image, which is very often confused with being an image of the French Revolution proper. This is essentially an image of revolution from 30, 40 years later. This is the revolution that results in, um, in King Louis the Philippe. Louis Philippe being um, put into power as, as the last monarch of France. But there's a lot here that looks like the revolution that we saw before. We have um, 
an allegory of liberty. This is Lady Liberty leading the people, uprising against a tyrannical government. She's got the tricolor flag, which um, came into being during the French Revolution. She's wearing that Phrygian hat that we saw with the guillotine earrings. She is um, bare-breasted and she's carrying a musket with a bayonet. Can you imagine if the French had given us uh, a statue of Lady Liberty that looked like this and not the statue that's in New York Harbor now? Um, it might have been more appropriate for America. <laughs> but, but this was a, a picture that was painted by Delacroix some decades after the French Revolution. But it, it wouldn't really be possible without the French Revolution because the French Revolution helped to put into um, uh, the French political life, the language of violence. So over the next few decades, there are all these different uprisings. And one of the things that you see in these uprisings against the monarchs, against power, was that in the winding, twisting medieval streets of Paris, they would create barricades um, and, and fight over barricades uh, against the guards. And, and whenever I say barricades, I think of Les Mis. That's the kind of, that's the, the time period that we're talking about here. Um, and the visual result of all of these battles over the barricades in the medieval streets of Paris was a complete redesign of Paris itself in the second half of the 19th century. And this was all um, done under a man named um, Georges Eugene, George Eugene Houseman. And so you have these grand boulevards in Paris now that are great for promenades. This is a painting by the by the impressionist artist Kayabat. Great for people watching, that sort of thing, which is all part and parcel to impressionism. But this is all a result of, of these battles in, in the streets that took place decades earlier. Now, other parts of the legacy of the French Revolution, well, the guillotine stuck around for quite some time. France was still executing people by guillotine when the first Star Wars movie came out. That was 1977. That was the last execution in France, and they were the last um, country in the world that was still using the guillotine. And over subsequent decades, people started to cozy up to the notion of the monarch again. There's a 2006 movie and book about Marie Antoinette and both of them were very sympathetic to, um, to the queen who um, is uh, oftentimes famously uh, cited with, with the phrase, let them eat cake. If the people are, are too poor to buy bread, let them eat cake. She um, most definitely didn't say that. Um, and it seems as though there's been an interest in kind of repairing her reputation. There's certainly an interest in repairing Versailles. Not that it was ever destroyed by the revolution itself, but one of the things that did happen was um, these golden gates were torn down by people who were storming the palace. They also took out a great deal of the furniture and artwork. A lot of it was restored. And in 2008, they rebuilt those golden gates at, a, at an expense of $8 million. These days, there are not mobs of angry revolutionaries inside the Palace of Versailles, but mobs of ordinary tourists <laughs> instead. There's about 10 million people a year that visit the palace and the gardens. And it is on the World Heritage Site. Um, it's uh, designated on the World Heritage Site by UNESCO. So it is one of the most important um, sort of cultural spaces in the world. And, and it has been preserved, which is really extraordinary. This is the very famous Hall of Mirrors that has about 351 different mirrors here that reflect the light outside in the gardens. And, um, and at certain times uh, when it was first built, it was illuminated by thousands of candles to be a corridor of light. You don't get the real effect when there's you know hundreds of people crammed into it. But in the end, we got to see the French Revolution through the eyes of these incredible artists. And they provided so much detail and so much insight into these leaders and their lives and this notion of what authority should look like and even sometimes the heartbreak in their lives. So we will end tonight sort of, you know, honoring them and their contributions and, um, and, and the fact that they've helped us understand this period of history a little bit better. So at this point, I welcome any questions or comments that anybody has, feel free to add it in the chat, or if you're really brave, 
you can take yourself off mute and we can have a conversation too. Oh, I'm looking, I'm going through some of these um, questions and comments. I see Jennifer asked about the hot air balloon in the corner of the picture of Versailles. That, um, that I'm not totally sure about. That's a really good question. I'm assuming it's from much later. I don't know much about that hot air balloon. I, I've always just loved this illustration here. It's by, it's illustrated by a woman named Catherine Baxter. And I think it's just like one of the best views of the garden, but I might have to go back and learn a little bit more about the hot air balloon. And GS says uh, they lived in Versailles Thanks for the presentation. Oh, um, yeah, why wouldn't any one of us want to go back to Versailles right now? Um, Alan, thanks for your comment. The very last one stayed there in Boston after he was exiled. The building he stayed in is still standing. Louis Philippe was in Boston. Wow, that's a, an amazing local connection. Um, I'm gonna have to look that up. Lynn, thank you for your nice note and Wendy too. Thank you everybody for your kindness and for, for zooming in tonight. I know there's um, plenty of other good things to, to watch on TV and to be doing. So I always appreciate that you join me and, um, and I hope you enjoyed this. And, I, and it's great food for thought, I think, in terms of um, contemplating what else is happening in, in our world in terms of politics and violence and, um, <laughs> and, and maybe this, this will give us some insight in terms of what direction we should be going to. So thank you everybody. And thank you, Sean, for subbing tonight. <laughs> so I hope to see you again next month. Our topic at that time is Rene Magritte and surrealist art. So that should be really good. And I promise 100% fewer beheadings. <laughs> I think I can guarantee that. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you so much, Jane. That was great.